Hey, welcome back to the channel. Uh, I want to start this video by just saying that I massively appreciate everybody who checked out the Los Angeles Chargers seven round mock draft. Today we're doing the Arizona Cardinals full mock draft. We're going to go through free agency. We're going to go through the players that might be leaving. We're going to go through team needs, coordinators, head coach, and the things that the Cardinals might need to do in the 2024 NFL draft. But I do just want to say a massive thank you for the people who checked out the Chargers video because that is my best performing video of all time to date. And I set myself a goal for this calendar year to get a video to 10,000 views. And at the time of recording this video, that one is approaching nearly 12,000. So that to me is amazing. That's one of the things I really wanted to do. I wanted to be, I wanted to tell myself I could do it. And we've got to that point already. And it's not even February yet. So I am incredibly grateful for that. And today we're going to go through the Arizona Cardinals full seven rounds, 2024 mock draft. We're going to talk about what happens if Marvin Harrison's off the board and potential complications that come with that, the potential to maybe move back. We're going to talk about all of that. So get comfortable. If you're a Cardinals fan, I would also really appreciate, at the time this video goes up, there's going to be a poll on my Twitter page that is asking you guys, as a fan base, because I want to know, what you would like to do if, by some strange reason, Marvin Harrison is gone by the time you get to the fourth overall pick. Okay, so let's say the Patriots take him at pick number three. I've set a poll up on Twitter. The link to it is in the description down below. So just take just a moment, maybe give me a follow on Twitter and reply or leave a note on that tweet to let me know what you guys would do. Because I would like to know what you as a fan base would like to do in that situation. Now, the 2024 mock draft for the Cardinals. So um, let's look at the current roster. So let's bring the current roster up here on the screen. There's a lot of things here that we need to talk about. So we're going to start here before we get into the draft and just kind of take a run through what we've got here. The first thing is the pending free agents. So the big one, of course, is Buda Baker. Now, there is a club option here, but it's going to cost the club a lot of money. I believe it's around $16 million or something along those lines if you want to keep him. And I believe that that only means he stays another year unless you work on an extension. So we obviously need to know kind of you know, what Jonathan Gannon's plans are long-term for this Cardinals defense. And obviously, Buda Baker is, at the moment, the leader of that unit. Uh, there are other guys on the roster that I think could play a lead role. I really liked what you had in Kazir White coming across from the Philadelphia Eagles with Gannon this past season. Uh, you have some great pieces, some young pieces who are showing good potential. But ultimately, there are a lot of needs on this defense, all right? Like, Marco Wilson played most of last season. As a Florida Gator fan, I know him as the shoe-throwing guy that cost us a game against LSU. And I'll be honest, I watched a lot of college football with Marco Wilson, and I was surprised to see him start in the NFL. And then he was cut, like, late in the season. And he'd started the whole year, and then he was cut. So there are a lot of needs on this team. You still need pieces on the defensive line. I don't like the Zayvon Collins experiment playing defensive end. And that's complicated because, again, now Zayvon Collins is this first-round pick who doesn't belong to the coaching staff that is now in charge or the GM. So, you know, we're going to have to see what happens with him, whether he gets moved back to linebacker, whether he gets traded potentially to a team where he might be a better fit. But at the moment, we don't know kind of how he fits. Um I did see a couple of decent things from Owen Popo. I think that, is it Popo or Popoe? Popo. I think it's Popo. Um, correct me if I'm wrong on that, but I do think there is a little bit of potential there, but you've got some guys here who are kind of filling roles at the moment. Jalen Thompson's going to be a good starter. He's still got one year, two years left on his deal, two years left on Jalen Thompson's deal, but you need corners. Uh, Antonio Hamilton is going to be a free agent, so you could look to bring him back, um, but there are other pieces here. There's a, basically, you could take, any player at any position on defense going into this year's draft. And I wouldn't be at all surprised, which for a mock draft makes things a lot more comfortable because you're kind of thinking like, well, I could take a corner late in the first round. I could take a safety early in the second round. I could take interior defensive line. I could take pass rushes. There are lots of ways you could look at this. Then offensively, Wide receiver is a major issue. Obviously, we know that. You have Michael Wilson, who I really liked as a prospect. The issue with him was obviously the injuries. I really liked him as a prospect. Uh, Rondell Moore's got one year left on his deal, and it feels like with Rondell Moore, we're just kind of, we're waiting for him to kind of get there. And, and so far, it's like, he'll have a game every now and then where you're like, there he is. 
there's the guy that we expected him to be. And then it, it just hasn't, there's no consistency to it. And he's been in and out the lineup and, uh, Greg Dortch is another one who's going to be a free agent. Uh, missed, we well, didn't miss the first half of the season, but he wasn't really in the rotation. And then second half of the year kind of came on, saw a lot more reps, a little bit of production. I think he'd be a cheap option for you to bring back because there isn't, it wasn't as much production there for another team to kind of look at him and be like, all right, we'll pinch him and pay him a little bit more money. So you can probably get a team friendly deal there to bring him back. Trey McBride was obviously the highlight of the offense this past season. And the offensive line, you've got Paris Johnson. You have a you know pillar of your offensive line there at right tackle for years to come. And then late in the year, Froholt played well at center in the last few weeks. And you had, sorry about the ads, uh, Elijah Wilkinson as well, who had a few good games playing at guard. Kelvin Beecham is serviceable, has one year left on his contract. So are you looking for a long-term replacement for him in this year's draft? That might be an option. The run game is decent. I mean, James Conner's not going to be around forever, but still decent. You can still, I don't think you need to try and address the run game in the offseason. I think you stick with what you have there. You have far more important needs. And that's kind of how we're going to look at it. So just to kind of go over the the free agent list, like as we talked about it, uh, you have Buda Baker, like I said at the top, the, I think that's probably what he's going to cost there, the 14,750. Obviously Marquise Brown and uh, we just talked about Greg Dortch as well. Those guys are going to be free agents. Rondell Moore has one year left on his deal. So your whole wide receiver room might look very different in two seasons time. Uh, There's a few other names here. Uh, Colon Castillo is a guy who kind of played all right coming in, played a little bit of guard. Um, I don't know that you keep him around though. He might end up being a free agent. Antonio Hamilton is a little bit older, but could add some experience to your secondary if you need it. And then you have like a lot of depth here, like Rashad Fenton. I don't think Pat Elfline will be back. Chris Barnes is a free agent too. Uh, Ezekiel Turner, also a free agent. So you guys let me know out of those players who you would bring back going into the 2024 season. But we're going to move on to the draft with probably, you know, one of the most exciting teams in the 2024 NFL draft because of the work that you did last season to gather picks, you know, traded back, then traded back up. I really liked what Monty Fort did with his first year as the team's GM. Played it really aggressively, was willing to kind of look at multiple trades inside the top 12. That's bold for a first year GM, and I liked it. I don't know that I would be surprised if he made some moves again this year, but we're certainly going to take a look. So let's load up the draft and we'll get started with the fourth overall pick in the first round. All right, so Cardinals on the board at four. Uh, I have run through the first three picks. I didn't do this. I just let it do it automated. I would be very surprised if the Patriots go Malik Neighbors over Marvin Harrison, but these months that lead up to the draft, you never know. Scouts could end up grading Neighbors as the better wide receiver once they start to get a look at him and the way he moves and some of the drills they'll do and the combine and all of that stuff, pro days, etc., there's a chance that happens. It happens all the time where a wide receiver will emerge as a better player than somebody who we had as the consensus number one. It does happen. But I would be very surprised if this was the case. If the Patriots are going to take a wide receiver, the chances are it's going to be Marvin Harrison. Largely, I think the first three picks are going to be quarterbacks. If that's the Patriots or another team trading up into the top three, I think it's going to be uh, a quarterback. The, The number one threat to the Cardinals is the Chicago Bears swapping picks with the Washington Commanders. If the Chicago Bears decide that they're willing to trade that pick, the chances are teams will be interested. The Atlanta Falcons will be one. The New York Giants could be another. Then you'll have other teams outside the top 10 that might be interested with the likes of the Denver Broncos, the Las Vegas Raiders, the New Orleans Saints, even the Seattle Seahawks. Like There are multiple teams that you could bring into that conversation. But for the Washington Commanders, if they're like, the pick's available and we could get Caleb Williams, we don't want another team to jump us, we could trade from two to, two to one, let the Chicago Bears come down to two, and then they can pick Marvin Harrison with the second overall pick, knowing that they got a haul for the number one. That's the biggest threat, in my mind, to the Cardinals getting Marvin Harrison. It's, you don't want the Bears trading with Washington. And that could happen. It could happen any time between now and and the draft itself. Like, I think the Bears put out like a highlight reel of JF1 sort of celebrating Justin Fields like a couple of days ago. And people were like, well, does this mean that they're all in on Fields? Does it mean they're trying to increase his draft stock with a highlight reel? There's going to be a lot of smoke and mirrors. But if we see the Bears come down to two, Cardinals fans, that's going to be stressful for you guys. 
you know, and then we're looking at maybe taking Malik Neighbours. And this is why I want you to answer that poll on my Twitter feed. So, you know, while you're watching this video, if you click the link down below, give me a follow because we're going to talk about some of the prospects that are going to suit you with the late first round pick at 27 as well. We could go through some tape, break some stuff down over on Twitter. So that's going to be a lot of fun. We'd love to have you there for that. But let me know what you think if Marvin Harrison does go off the board. In this situation, it, this is a no-brainer, right? You lose DeAndre Hopkins, I would let Marquise Brown go, and then Marvin Harrison's the future of your wide receiver room. That's the that's how this draft starts perfectly for the Arizona Cardinals, right? You get Kyler Murray, a number one, pure number one wide receiver who's going to be one of the top 10 producting, producting, producing wide receivers in the NFL out of the gate, right? If With the volume of targets that we could expect to see for Marvin Harrison, could be 150 plus targets, you know, particularly with a lack of uh, competition in the wide receiver room. It would be him and Trey McBride. Those are your top two options. And we'd be looking at that similar to, you know, the volumes, not necessarily the style or, you know, the type of player, but the volumes that we were looking at for Travis Kelsey and Tyreek Hill in Kansas City with a tight end wide receiver combination. So the pick here is Marvin Harrison. And I think, you know, should he be off the board, you'd be looking at maybe Malik Neighbors, potentially just sucking it up and going for Joe Alt as a franchise left tackle. I think he's a slightly higher grade, ready to go day one more than Olu Fashionu. So I would potentially look at going for Joe Alt. You don't need Brock Bowers. That's not going to be the case. Roma Dunes could come into the conversation. Talis Fuaga. I mean, if it's anybody but Joe Alt or Malik Neighbors, I'd be trading down. I would trade down with somebody like the Falcons, particularly if the wide receivers off the board and Jaden Daniels is available, because then the Falcons could come up with you to four, draft Jaden Daniels, and then you guys take whoever you want at pick number eight. That would be smart to me, and you'd still get a franchise tackle at that spot. For now, we're going to take Marvin Harrison Jr., and we're going to move on to pick number 27, which is that and 35... I'm just as excited for the Cardinals here at pick 27 and 35 as I am at the pick number four because you guys are going to get three top 40 talents in this year's draft. And those are the sort of things where you get three players early on and if you hit on those, they can alter your franchise and it changes the future of the program entirely, right? You need So it's very, very crucial. This is a big year for the Arizona Cardinals in the draft. And I'm feeling the pressure myself to <laughs> try and get this right. So, you know, Monty Ossenfort and his staff are going to be feeling that pressure because three picks early on like this can change the future massively. So, you know, let's try and make sure that we get this right. So let's look at the board at pick 27, kind of see who's gone off the board. So Chris Braswell goes the pick before. I think that's a shame because I think he'd be a really good fit for the Cardinals. Uh, there are a couple of edge rushers rushes left that would be like first rounders. Well, one, Braylon Trice is probably the only one that I would say is left. Uh, Leitu Latu is gone off the board. Uh, you're not going to be in the range for somebody like Dallas Turner or Jared Verse at pick number 27. So you kind of looking at that second grade first round tier, which is Chris Braswell and Braylon Trice. And I would have Braswell as the higher pick. So uh, you kind of get him pinched there from the Tampa Bay Bucks, which is unfortunate. Byron Murphy is climbing draft boards. He's going to be a first rounder. You don't want Armarius Mims uh, or JC Latham because both of those guys are right tackles and you drafted yours last year. So you don't need to worry about that. There will be a couple of QBs that go off the board a little later on as well. I think we do see Bo Nix go in the first round. I think the Rams is a good spot for him. I think the Steelers is another one that could be a potential for him as well. Uh, so let's kind of keep an eye on that. And then there's going to be a run of wide receivers. So Brian Thomas is going to go. You might get Troy Franklin dropped to 27, um, but there's enough wide receiver talent that you don't necessarily need to worry about it because the 35 pick is going to be great for you guys for wide receiver talent. Because when you look at the wide receivers available in the second round here, you have uh, AD Adonai Mitchell, uh, Keon Coleman, Vontez Walker, Xavier Le Xavier Leggett. Um, avoid Jer Jermaine Burton. I do not like the prospect. Jermaine Burton, the attitude man, like just... It, he's here at the ADP of 50, but I really don't think there are teams that are going to take that risk with him. I just don't. Uh, Lad McConkey. Now, this is interesting because I don't know that Lad McConkey makes it to 35. When you look at the other teams in the late first round, Buffalo is one that he could land with. The Kansas City Chiefs is another that he could seriously be a good option for offensively. The Carolina Panthers would be one. I just don't know that he makes it to you at 35. If he does, then I think we would be in a good position to take him. But 
Do you see what I mean about taking wide receiver with the 35 pick? Because whoever you pick here, two or three of these guys are still going to be here. So if you do your kind of due diligence and you grade these guys and your scouts are like, all right, well, the offense works with A.D. Mitchell. It works with Xavier Leggett. It works with Keon Coleman. We like all three of those guys. We can afford to use this 27 pick somewhere else. Um, and this is why I don't hate trading down from four either. Because if you trade down from four to eight, and let's say you get the Atlanta Falcons second rounder, so you get pick 43, and then obviously some other pieces as well, if they're, if they're drafting their franchise quarterback, like you want to take them to the cleaners over it. If you get the 43 and other stuff too, now you have four picks like around the top 40 of this year's draft. So uh, in the second or in the late first round, let's look at the big board. A um, lot of cornerback talent. So Ennis Rakestraw Jr. is a bigger, longer corner, very aggressive in the run game. Um, got that prototypical size, you know, long arms, bit sauce Gardner-like in that sense. There's a lot to like there about him. I wasn't as high on Kamari Lassiter. I think he's probably a late day, well, a late second rounder, early third rounder from what I've seen from the tape so far. Got a great motor, plays very aggressive, um, good football player. Like, let's not let's not mistake that. But I kind of had some concerns about how he tracked the football and played coverage going down the field. Doesn't get his head around all the time, a little bit grabby. Um, I think maybe late second round for him. So I'm a little lower on him than uh, potentially some others. Quinion Mitchell is one who should go in the first round. I think if he tests well um, at like pro day, combine, all that stuff, um, considering the type of player he is, as like an aggressive ball hawking cornerback who can play time at tight man coverage was a huge standout for Toledo these last couple of years. Um, I think he will be a first rounder and I think he could also be the sort of first rounder who is a tone setter at DB for you guys. Like we're not talking Patrick Peterson levels, but there, there is that upside to it, you know, so getting somebody like that in the first round at a clear position of need, I think Quinion Mitchell and Ennis Rakestraw are both very viable options here. I don't know as much about TJ Tampa and I get stuck on this every time I do one of these drafts because I haven't watched enough of him play. So I need to go and do that. So I'm gonna maybe we'll do that one on Twitter actually. So, you know, let's hit the Twitter link in the description down below and we'll talk about TJ Tampa on Twitter because I want to do that and see if we can uh, make a decision there. All right, so just looking here, looking kind of through the board at what's available, a couple of other names that stood out to me. Uh, Graham Barton and Troy Fatanu, franchise left tackle. Um, Fatanu worries me a little bit because he kind of just looks to me more like he'd be suitable as a guard. And and that's there's nothing wrong with that if you draft him and he ends up being a, you know, a standout left guard for you long term. I just don't know about the size at left tackle. Um, but, you know, really aggressive blocker. I think there's a lot to like there. I just don't know if he's big enough to play the left tackle role in the NFL as a blindside protector for Kyler Murray. Decent run blocker, gets down to the second level well. Again, you know, will play aggressively in the run game, but not as primed as a run in as a run game blocker as he would be in pass protection. So Troy Fatana is one. Graham Barton is another. If you were to go down kind of the tackle route, I wonder if we take the top corner available in Ennis Rakestraw here, knowing that there's at least two tackles left on the board and that those guys are likely going to drop into the th into the second round. And the other guy is Kieran Amagaji. I've been practicing how to say that as well. Absolutely nailed it. Um, Kieran Amagaji, uh, who again is a little bit more of a project, um, but I've talked about this in other videos where if you can afford to, you know, particularly for a team like the Cardinals who already has a left tackle, at least for this coming season, Maybe you draft him, let him play at guard. This is a big man as well. And eventually he becomes the franchise left tackle. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to take Ennis Rakestraw Jr. because he is a lockdown corner who is going to really help you in the run game and play some really aggressive football. And we're going to hope and pray that we can get who we wanted here at pick 35 as well. So Ennis Rakestraw is an Arizona Cardinal. Then we go Lad McConkey to the Buffalo Bills. I do like the fit. I could see that happening. Kamari Lasseter in the first round to the Lions. Cameron Kit Kintins to the uh, Baltimore Ravens. That's an interesting one. I don't really know why they would do that. Braylon Trice to the Kansas City Chiefs. Tyler Newbin to the San Francisco 49ers. Keon Coleman to Carolina. Mm, don't love that. The, the Carolina Panthers taking the wide receiver in the first two rounds who struggles the most with separation considering the offense they had last year isn't going to happen. Just won't be the case. They'd be more likely to take someone like Adonai Mitchell, Xavier Leggett, someone like that. This is 
a terrible idea. You know, I like Keon Coleman, but his issue is separation. And, you know, you know Bryce Young struggled to find anybody that could separate all season for the uh, for the Carolina Panthers. Then Vontez Walker to the Patriots, um, who have not yet drafted a quarterback. All right, so the three tackles that we wanted are still on the board. So the question I have here is, and I would probably rank these in terms of ceiling with... Mm, uh, Troy Fatanu is up there, but I just don't know that it's at tackle. Graham Barton, solid. And then the guy that stands out to me is Kieran Amagaji. And I think when we get to, you know, seeing a lot of the drills, I don't know if he's going to the senior bowl. I have to look that up. If he is going to the senior bowl, is this going to be one of those guys who really, you know, shines at the senior bowl in those one-on-one drills against defensive ends? Um, and kind of makes his way into kind of a late first round pick. I think, you know, we've seen he's he's coming from Yale, so he hasn't had as much exposure, but he's still being talked about a lot as one of the better prospects. So I wouldn't be opposed to taking Amagaji here. Um, we will just look at kind of best player available as well. I don't mind them go- going back to back on wide receiver. I don't mind that at all. Um, but I do think even if you take Amagaji, that he could probably play guard for you all season this year. And then he kicks out to left tackle if you let Kelvin Beecham go at the end of the year. Uh, that looks like the best fit for me here. But then I'm passing on guys like Quinion Mitchell. Mm. AD, AD Mitchell as well. Xavier Leggett. Don't, I think this is a little higher for Caelan Bullock. Um, I know that you need safeties. I would look at safeties. Uh, if Cameron Kinchins is available here, he would definitely be an option. I think he might be available here too. Um, looking at what we have, Chop Robinson, bit more of a project. I'm going to go Amagaji. And there are multiple ways we could have gone with this. So please don't, you know, burn me down in the comment section. But let me know what you think about it. Because I think to have him play guard for the first year, let him get to grips with the offense and, you know, the speed of the NFL and everything. And then at the end of the season, you can make an assessment based on what you want to do with Kelvin Beecham and whether you can move him out to left tackle. So that's how I would do those first three picks. But you can see, you know, based on having three picks early in the draft, how many different ways we could have gone about that. And trading in and out of those picks definitely makes some sense. So if you'd like to see one with trades, maybe we can come back to that a little closer to the draft. Maybe we'll do another round where we go through the teams and do them by... Um, by trade and and all sorts of different things to make it a little bit more in-depth. We can definitely do that. Um, But that puts us on the board at pick 66 in the third round. We have a corner, a tackle, and a wide receiver. So needs here, I would still be happy to take offensive linemen. Uh, I'd still be happy to take another wide receiver um, and definitely addressing more more spots in the secondary, more corners, a safety, wouldn't be against it, and maybe a linebacker or two. It's not the strongest linebacker class. I will say that. Uh, Junior Colson, I think, deserves to be higher than an ADP of 80. So he's somebody you could look at. Peyton Wilson from North Carolina State. Need to watch some tape, but from what I've seen so far, looks decent. Can't really make too much of a judgment on him so far. I don't know everybody in the draft. Like We have a little bit of work to do here to kind of get to that level. Uh, Javon Bullard is an interesting one for a third round pick for uh, for the Cardinals. Um, What else do we have here? All right, so I've gone through everything on the board here and looked at all sorts of different options and stuff, and I kept coming back to one name. And, you know, you get your kind of volume target in Marvin Harrison Jr. at pick number one or pick number four in the first round. Um, You take a tackle, you know, you address a couple of needs. Then in round three, I think you can get somebody who can really add something to that offense. And all of a sudden, if you've got Marvin Harrison, Trey McBride, and then Jalen McMillan, from Washington. You have your core for your wide receiver room for the next several years. And uh, the reason that I would do that is because this guy is very different to what Marvin Harrison Jr. is, but you're getting a guy who is a separator, who knows how to work in space, who knows how to throttle down, speed up, set up defensive backs, find space in tight coverage, can play at all three levels, can be your deep threat. Like this guy can be your replacement for Marquise Brown. And, you know, I wonder how productive Jalen McMillan would be if he wasn't playing alongside two other great wide receivers that are also in this year's draft. I think the, you know, the elevation of his game in 2023 was profound. 
And I think he can be a really good player for the Arizona Cardinals. So I'm actually quite excited about that just as much as I am the earlier picks. Because now you have Marvin Harrison, Rondell Moore can still do a little bit. And you have Jalen McMillan, who, you know, when you talk about the things you want in wide receivers coming through to the NFL, you want guys who can separate, guys who have an extensive route tree, guys who can find space against pro-level coverage. And this is him. So in the early third round, sign me up. Okay, pick 71. So, um, you know, we're on the board here twice early in the third round, and I should have mentioned it before the McMillan pick because being able to pick a luxury wide receiver there is impacted or is made possible by the fact that you have another pick like five picks later because now you can look at guys like Sione Vaki from uh, Utah. You could look at the linebacker in Junior Colson that we mentioned a little earlier. You could look at a safety in Javon Bullard. You could look at corners. Mike Semra still is still here. Uh, Tyke Smith was a guy who went from West Virginia to Georgia, um, was a standout safety at West Virginia, then had like some injuries and all sorts of different complications getting to Georgia. And it took him a long time to get into the lineup. I think you have something here in Tyke Smith, who if he'd been healthy, would be drafted a lot sooner. So I need to go into him and look at the story as to what exactly it was that kept him kept him out for a while at Georgia because he didn't. I know there was a reason he didn't play for quite some time, so I'm going to go and look at that at some point just to fill that little gap in my knowledge. In um, you know, we're not perfect around here, um, but there are guys who can definitely contribute here. Guys who can be starters like Gabriel Murphy from UCLA, Christian Mahogany from Boston College could come in and start as a guard. You have. You know, you don't need another wide receiver, but there's still guys like Malachi Corley on the board, who is a very interesting prospect. Cooper B, but we, I feel like we draft him all the time. He's too low on boards. He's going to be a top two round pick, I think. Um, Jacob Cowing is a very exciting wide receiver out of Arizona. Uh, Mason Smith from LSU, defensive line. That's interesting. So there's a lot of good things here. Um, I'm going to have to decide. Dominic Puny is one who you could draft, who could come in and play guard. Um, but if you've already drafted um, your guy earlier, Amagaji, I always want to say Abakanji for some reason, Amagaji at uh, pick 35, then you don't really need Puny here because he's another one who is very similar to Fatanu in my mind, where he's a little bit smaller and not necessarily primed to play blindside tackle in the NFL, so could probably kick into guard. Um, so let's have a look here. We've got Nehemiah Pritchett, another taller corner, a bit like Ennis Rakestraw. Um, all right, I'm going to come back to you. All right, so here's what I'm thinking, and uh, I'm pretty fired up about it. Uh, Arizona, you guys will know, the fan base will know, you were the worst team in the NFL this past season defending the run, right? You know, let's go and look at the numbers. Let's just make sure that we're accurate on this, okay? Team opponent rushing yards per game, 2023. The Chicago Bears were the number one team in the league in terms of defending the run, right? Arizona, dead last, 143.2 rushing yards allowed, and it only got worse late in the season. So this is a very real issue that you're going to want to kind of shore up. And Jonathan Gannon comes from a place in Philadelphia where he had the likes of Javon Hargrave to work with and Fletcher Cox, and he knows the value of those guys plugging up the middle. So... For the Cardinals, you have Dwayne Carter here available, and I don't know that he's actually going to be available here, but Dwayne Carter is available here as things stand at pick 71 in the third round. And this guy is a run defending machine on the defensive line with the athleticism to play in pursuit, to chase the football down, to get around the defensive line and in that area and make big plays, getting off of blocks, you know, standing up running backs in the hole and just shoring up the middle of the field. And I think, you know, you look at everything else here and guys who can have an impact, Junior Colson can definitely have an impact at the second level, but why not block that up one level sooner? You know, you've got offensive linemen, there are safeties you could look at, edge rush maybe, but the guy here who is definitely the best talent, I think, who could be the biggest impact for you as a third rounder is Dwayne Carter. So I'm going to go for him at pick 71 and then we're on the board one more time in round three. And then in the interest of time, you guys still have seven picks left on the board. I don't want this to be like an hour and a half long video while we dive into every pick. So we're going to make this selection here and then we're going to take uh, ourselves to the end of the draft and we'll do like an end of draft summary on the rest of the picks that we made all in one go. So 
still a lot left here that I like. Um, you've still got a lot of good players here. I mean, we were on the board like nearly 20 picks sooner. And there's still guys here that I was looking at. Like now my Pritchett is definitely one. Cedric Van Pran at center. Okay, I'm going to make this selection and then we'll talk about it. All right, so I've done it. This has been a tough one. I've looked at a lot of different talents here. The, the trouble is here, and particularly with the way that guys are graded on PFF, and you shouldn't use just one uh, system as your kind of ranking system. There are a lot of guys here that I'd be way higher on, way lower on. For example, I don't think that Christian Mahogany is a day two pick at all. I think he'll be a day three pick. There's a couple of other guys that I feel the same way about. Marshall Nealand is another one. Good instincts as a football player, but I just don't know that he's going to be taken in the you know round two or three. Like this is an early fourth round, late third round grade, I guess. But he's more fourth, fifth round to me. But Cooper Beeb is a guy who should be going like you know day early day two in my mind at the very least. Uh, I think Mason Smith should be a little bit higher. So there's a lot of different guys here, and obviously it's really difficult to kind of make your way through this and uh, analyze it accurately. But looking at what the Cardinals need. Um, I think, you know, we've addressed a few pieces in the skill positions. Um, we've looked at adding some depth to the wide receiver room and things like that. The guy I landed on here is Zach Zinter from Michigan. Um, as a really well-balanced guard, both in the pass game with, you know, a very aggressive style and good balance, plays with good balance in pass protection. But I really like him as a run blocker. I think he's got that kind of like, you know, he wants to go down the field and hurt somebody in, you know, the run game. And I think the Cardinals are maybe missing a bit, little bit of that. Um, I know that Will Hernandez is there right now, but if you add Zach Zinter to it, then, you know, if he hits and if you hit on your other pieces as well, then you have three starters and a couple of guys that were there last year who kind of made some real progress late in the year. And that makes me feel good about the offensive line. I was kind of making my way through this draft and thinking like, we still need at least one more piece on the O-line. And Zach Zinter, with the experience that he has and stuff, could be the guy that comes in and ends up being a starter for you this season. So I think to be able to get someone with that upside in the third round is uh, is a definite plus. So I would go for him here. And now we're in round four. So we have six picks left to make. And here's another reason before we go to the end of the draft. Here's another reason that I really think that we'll see Monty Austin for and the Cardinals moving around in this draft a lot because you can package these picks, right? You Like six picks between round four and round seven, it's not particularly necessary. So you could package the pick that we just made, which was what, pick number 90? Yeah, pick 90 and the 133 or the 140 and move up to pick 78 or 77 or wherever you want to move to, move down from here, move up from here and end up picking eight or nine guys who are going to be big influences who, you know, the early guys will be starters, the later guys will be able to kind of rotate in. That's the aim here. I don't think you want to be in a position where you end up taking or using all of these picks. So let's round out the draft and we will uh, we'll talk about it right at the end. All right, so this is why you package picks because this is too many rookies. Like, it's too many rookies. But we'll go through it. Obviously, we've been through the first six picks. Um, so round four, I went for the running back. Audric Estime. Estime? Estime. Uh, from Notre Dame. Uh, so... By the time you get to the fourth round, if you've already drafted six players, you can afford to add somebody who's going to be that kind of give you a little bit of like youthfulness in the run game. James Connor, I really like. Uh, Michael Carter, who came over, was cut by the Jets, I believe, ended up in Arizona. Not so sure. And I just think like you, you know, you've got Demacado there. I think maybe adding another young running back to give that run game a little bit more of an edge. Um I don't dislike at all. So I think Audric Estime is a guy to look at in the fourth round. And I will look up how to pronounce his name correctly um, before I get into any more videos going forward. This is tough. There's a lot of names and stuff to learn here, man. Like I'm, you know, doing my best. And I also, there's a language barrier, all right? I'm British. Some stuff we're going to get wrong. Anyway, um, late in the fourth round, we went for Xavier Thomas, who is really showing out in shrine bowl drills in the last few days like the i've been keeping up with kind of the highlights we've been talking about it on twitter and stuff a little bit 
Xavier Thomas looks really phenomenal coming off the edge. Like some of the speed, I watched him like make a couple of moves coming off the edge and then bouncing inside uh, to get past this blocker and stuff. This guy plays with energy off the edge and he looks like he's going to be one of these guys who, you know, starts to really show out in the drills um, and in the end of season stuff and could end up rising up draft board. So ended up with a B plus grade on that. Uh, Johnny Dixon from Penn State. So no harm uh, throwing another pick here at a potential starter at defensive back. Uh, Johnny Dixon made a couple of nice plays against Marvin Harrison this year. Um, he's going to get flagged a little bit if he doesn't polish up his game, which kind of is what's brought him down draft boards a little bit. Um, but to see him in round five, considering the athleticism, the potential to play tight coverage, the, the potential to make pass breakups, uh, and some of the things that he's put on tape with the Nittany Lions... Uh, to get him in round five is good value. Um, and I think if you watch the tape, you will agree. Uh, don't agree with the grade here on Layden Robinson at all. I have him above the likes of Mahogany. Um, I think he's one of the better guards in this year's draft. And clearly, uh, PFF don't agree. Um, you know, I use PFF's tool because it's one of the best mock draft tools. Don't always agree with their grades at all or the grading system, so to speak. So uh, Layden Robinson from Texas A&M in round six, I think he will go slightly earlier than that once the scouts get to see him a little bit more. Um, I do think there's a lot to like there about him from the Aggies. So, you know, in this year's draft, you need more depth offensively. I'm not saying Layden Robinson is going to be a starter, but with the pieces you kept and with Beecham at left tackle and with Paris Johnson at right tackle, plus Amagaji, Zach Zinter, and some more depth later in the draft, I think you're setting yourself up well to at least find five good starters going into next year. Sam Hartman in round seven, long-term college quarterback um, who ended up in Notre Dame for the last year or two. Um, but to get, you know, we see teams do this all the time now where they're taking a QB late in the draft. I don't think the Cardinals would be any different. You know, they don't necessarily have a good backup plan at the moment behind Kyler Murray. Um, so drafting somebody in round seven, I would not be surprised at all to see a late quarterback uh, end up here in Arizona. And then Blake Watson with the last pick who went to Memphis this past year and like help them re-establish their run game entirely they were a better team this year they were missing a starter at running back he came from a I want to say a juco school but it might have been like a d3 school um ended up at memphis they recruited him really well got him to go over there and I believe he was either just shy of a thousand yards or like the first thousand yard rusher that they've had in several years um so Blake Watson, good production with the Memphis Tigers, um, going to run the ball well up the middle. Uh, so you add a couple of running backs, like, you know, typically you wouldn't take two running backs, but typically you also wouldn't pick 12 rookies. So, um, you know, we were kind of looking with at what to do with these last few picks a little bit here towards the end. So that's going to wrap the video. Uh, looking at what we did early, I really like that we got like at least five, if Zach Zinter hits, then six starters in the first three rounds. Dwayne Carter might be my favorite pick of the entire draft for the Cardinals in terms of filling a need and plugging up the middle in the run game. I think that's essential. I think when you look at the division they're in, it's even more essential. Uh, and Dwayne Carter's going to have his work cut out. And I think he will be a great player if Arizona decide to go for him. Um, but overall, uh, you know, with the Cardinals roster, there were a lot of needs, a lot of things that you need to cover, a lot of ways that you could go. And as I said, I've got that poll that's going to go up on Twitter when this video goes live. So please do follow the link in the description if you made it to the end of the video. Let me know in the comments what you think, of course. Leave a like, subscribe to the channel. That would be amazing. But check that poll out and let me know what you would do if Marvin Harrison is not on the board. And I hope you guys get him because you deserve it. And I think he would be great for your franchise. So you guys let me know and I will see you in the next video for another mock draft in the build up to the 2024 draft. We'll have a great time and I'll see you next time. Thank you for watching.